invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. I invite you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 14. This is page 901 in your pew Bible. As always, you're welcome to bring your own Bible, use a Bible app on your phone too. Um, But for me, it's really important to just to open up your Bibles and feel free also, even as we're going through the sermon, free to even look at context, look at things that are going around the passage that we're, we're looking at together. Because there's a lot of that today. John chapter 14. There's one line I want you to look at in John chapter 14. In John 14, 1, just... A, we're going to end with troubled, so let's read this together. Where it's the, the last word will be troubled. We read, let not your hearts be troubled. We'll just stop right there. There you go. Let not your hearts be troubled. You know, the word, word troubled could also be understood as distressed. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. You know, um, in that video we just watched, fear is often associated with death. It's like the ultimate thing that people fear, I think. Um, but in this case, the question is, what, is, what is troubling Jesus' disciples? Why is Jesus saying, let not your hearts be troubled? Well, it had been a rather distressing evening, you could say, for the disciples that day. They were in the upper room. Um, that, that's where Jesus was celebrating the Last Supper with the disciples. And Jesus had been saying a lot of cryptic things, strange things have been happening, and you'd be un- it, understanding what was going on there, you would, you would, you would get that they wouldn't quite know how to feel in that moment. Jesus had spoken of betrayal, and then suddenly Judas had gotten up and, and left the room. Hmm, that's weird. Then Jesus started speaking about how he was going to be going away, and this wasn't part of the disciples' plan. What does this mean? It's very strange. And then Peter responded. He said, he said, where are you going, Jesus? And Jesus responded by saying, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow afterward. What? I mean, this wasn't part of how things were supposed to go. And so Peter naturally said, you know, I will lay down my life for you. I'm not going to stop following you. I'm not going to just, you know, abandon you. And, and Jesus looks at Peter and says, well, you will deny me three times. What is going on? It's like getting together as a family, expecting this, this fun evening, and then it turns into this very dark and, and foreboding kind of evening. And then so Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Where was Jesus going? Where was Jesus going? And what did this mean for his disciples? Now, the prospect of someone we love going away is distressing, isn't it? I mean, I think all of us, and, and you know, as, as pastors, Pastor Swin and I hear a lot of, uh, you know, f- families right here at Bethany who go through the, those stages of going through troubling times where you're worried about a family member, but just the prospect of someone going away in any form is troubling, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Um, even being separated from the people we love for a couple weeks can give us anxiety. It breaks the pattern. It's why being an empty nester can be a hard thing because you've been so used to having those kids in your home and now suddenly everything's changing. They're going away. But on All Saints Day, what we ponder is the reality of going away but not coming back, at least not in the way that we want them to come back. <laughs> that makes sense. So fill in that blank on the screen. If you ever found yourself asking that question, what would I do without so-and-so? Imagine your life without that person. They've gone away. What does that mean for you? What does it mean for them? You know, today on All Saints Day, it's, good, it's important for us to acknowledge that for some of us, we don't have to imagine. For some of us, we don't. Today, I miss fill in the blank. I know so many of, this, of us in this room have people that we loved and that we miss you know, for me, I put a fill in that blank with my father, all four of my grandparents I shared with the kids here just a little while ago. 
several, met many church members that I knew and loved, friends. And the longer you live, the more that list seems to grow. And news that we received this morning, uh, Pastor Carl Zardi, he passed away this morning. A longtime servant here at Bethany. Um, quite fitting in All Saints Day, but you think about somebody that, that was a blessing to many people and would be missed, of course, by his family. What does your list look like? Who are the people that you wish you could hug again or you wish you could have that one more conversation with? You know, the absence of the people that we love causes trouble, doesn't it? Why? Why does it cause trouble? I would argue it's we miss the presence that they give us, the conversations. We have many memories, and oftentimes it shouldn't surprise us that the longer that we miss people, oftentimes the memories that flood our minds are always most usually the best memories. The people who love us have room for us. You ever thought about it that way? The people that we love and especially the people that we miss. We miss them so much because those people had a tendency to have room for us. There was always a place for us in their presence. In 2007, my wife and I moved with our two-month-old daughter to St. Louis, Missouri. And we did this, it was, it was quite a leap of faith for us at the time. We moved away from our family. And I've been talking, we've, Pastor Sweeney, I've been talking to you about households lately and how households, the co- biblical concept isn't just the people that live under your roof. Think about it this way. Not just the people you're related to, but the people that you're closely connected to, the people that come into your house, the people that you know well. So that could include friends as well. So for us leaving, it meant not only were we, when, when we went to St. Louis, were we leaving our family, they were going to be a long distance away from us. On top of that, we were basically leaving our household behind because all the people that we were closely connected to, they weren't coming with us. It was like starting all over in many ways. And I still remember, it was, the whole purpose of this was, I'm going to seminary, and my wife is going to be the one basically completely supporting us as a Lutheran school teacher. And we're moving to a city, and it's expensive to live in the city, and how is this all going to work? I remember when we first, when we finally got settled in our new condo, or not condo, our new uh, um, townhouse, um, we went to Walmart. And I, I remember sh- uh, shopping, and I'm just sitting there thinking, what did we just do? <laughs> like, we're for real doing this now. I can't change my mind now, at least not right now. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues that we had, and this is, this, these are, this is a small yet incredibly large detail. My daughter needed to be watched. We, she had just been born a couple months earlier. And um, what happened was we found somebody from the place where my wife was teaching that would, that would watch her. It turned out that it was going to be an hour and a half trip um, one way for me to go to school um, and pick her up or drop her off. So it was going to be a three hour, I was going to be in the car for three hours every day just to get her where she needed to go. I wasn't too excited about that. And then things got worse because her babysitter called us and said, we can't watch her anymore. Some dynamic shifted in her house. And so suddenly my wife is just starting teaching and we need to figure out now who's going to watch my daughter and our household. (laughs) Who do you ask? The fifth grade teacher where where my wife taught, she marched down to the choir room that day. Choir people. We love you, choir people. Um... (laughs) And she said, somebody's got to watch this little girl. (laughs) And a woman named Marie spoke up and she said, I'll do it. Marie lived with her husband, Bill, who was a retired Air Force officer. At the time, I was just thankful to have somebody that would watch our daughter. Little did I know that Marie and Bill would become a part of our household. Marie called me. So, so my daughter started watching, watching uh, my daughter every week. It was Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. I got to hang out at home on Wednesdays, but she would watch my daughter. And um, I still remember the call that she made. Um, this was only about a month or two into her watching her. She said, I don't want you to pay me anymore. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Of course we're going to pay you. 
she said, I've seen where you live. You're not paying me anymore. She said, you're not going to pay me anymore, but on the condition that you use what you normally pay me to get a better place. And so that's what we did. And it was amazing. Um, <laughs> We went from a place that smelled like smoke because people, it was, it, to, to going to a house, to actually a rental home. It wasn't big, but it was, it was so nice. And that was her gift to us. Bill was as big of a softie as Marie. Um, they would oftentimes cook for us to give my wife a break, give me a break in the evening, so we'd come over and she knew I liked stuffed peppers. <clears throat> and uh, Bill had this big screen TV he was so proud of, so I'd go down there and we'd watch sports. We really enjoyed it. It was fun. <laughs> and the more on the surface you'd think this guy is this military guy, but he's such a softy. And, he, and you can see the picture. That's Bill with uh, actually my son because he got to hold my son later. And the lower left-hand corner, that's him with my daughter. Um, they, they actively sought to take care of us, and they had no reason to. They had no reason to. I remember when, when both my daughter and my wife got sick, Early on, too, Marie brought supplies for Megan because I had, to go, I had to go to school, I had to go to class, so she helped out. Did you know this? When we went to our vicarage, this is a year, this is a um, pastor and training year, so you move for a year away and then you come back. It was, we were going to be moving to Hutchinson, Minnesota from St. Louis, an hour away, uh, nine hours away, and then we had to come back to St. Louis. They drove with us the nine hours to help us move there. In short, the reason I'm telling you this story is they always had room for us, even when it was inconvenient. And it was pure grace. They didn't have to. You know, as followers of Jesus, we can find comfort knowing God always has room for us. For Jesus, going away meant death. That's what he was telling his disciples. I'm going to be going away. And what he mean, meant by that is just in a, just in a sh- short time here, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be taken away. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to go away. And you can't follow me and, on, this, <laughs> on this path. This is mine alone. Now, Jesus also knew something about the disciples. In just a few days, those disciples will be huddled in a locked room for fear their own lives would be taken. They'd be troubled, they'd be distressed, they'd be fearful, and they'd be alone. Let's read John 14, 1 again here. Now we're going to read the whole thing. I invite you to read that with me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let's stop right there. What do we know about God? God created the entire world. He created order in this entire world. And, and there are beautiful things that we see in this world, but at the same time, we also see the consequences of sin all around us. We're distressed by the things we see, by the things we experience, the things that we wish were better. And so what we remember also is that God is a God of promise. Earlier, early on, God said, I'm going to send a Savior. And when Jesus says, believe also in me, he's saying, I'm the fulfillment of that promise. What's the problem here? The problem of sin is we have this disease in our heart that separates us from God. We can't be in his presence because of sin. In other words, we have no place in his household. No place. And so Jesus says, believe also in me. Believe in what I say and believe in what I do. Jesus came to be the fulfillment of that promise. Let's read verse 2 and he tells us exactly why he went away. Let's read 2 together. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? As I said, sin separates us from God. It also separates us from one another. The consequence of sin is death. And so this would be like, like for us, we're like rebellious children and our Heavenly Father should just kick us to the curb. That's that's the way things are set up. And so Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. He's using household language to help us understand how a relationship with God works. To help us to understand that he's the one that had to go to the cross to ensure that we would always have a place in God's presence. And that means beyond death itself. Peter, you can't follow me now, but eventually you are going to follow me. 
you're going to follow me. You're going to be sharing the good news of what I've done. And you're going to follow me all the way past death into eternity because I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house and you are never going to be without a home. Ever. Do you believe that? Believe in God. Believe also in me. You know, what Jesus was sharing with his disciples is true for us also. Sorry, I'm behind on my slides. <laughs> In 2017, we received a call from Marie. Bill had been struggling with cancer for a very long time. And he lost the battle. And so what we did was what we just came natural after all that they'd done for us, we packed up our things and we traveled to Missouri. You know what the sermon was based on? John 14. You know what the pastor's first line was? In Bill and Marie's house, there was always room. What I found so powerful about that was I was sitting next to other families with young children who they also welcomed into their home church workers, other people who needed help. And for Marie and Bill, because of their relationship with Jesus, for them it was only natural to open their doors to others. But in that moment, it was a day to remember, yeah, the blessing that, that Bill was for so many people, but ultimately find joy in the fact that God had even more room for Bill because of Jesus. Today, I'm sure that many of you can think of people that you wish you could talk to again, hug again, embrace again, people that had impact in your life, people that maybe you're sitting in that pew because of those people. But today, most of all, on All Saints Day, as forgiven people, we celebrate and have joy with all the saints because God has room for all those who have faith in him. He has plenty of room not just for you and for me, but for all those who've gone before us. So as we remember Jesus and the presence that he has prepared for us with our father's house, in our Father's house in heaven, and as we remember the people that have blessed us in our lives, I would ask you to also consider this. Do you have room in your heart for others? Is your heart open to the people around you who might you welcome into your household? How might you be the hands and feet of Jesus for others? In Jesus' name, amen.